This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Lesson 3 is titled The Promised Son and is ready for teaching on January 15. It's authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. It comes from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, and I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 8. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we continue on with this series of lessons on the book of Hebrews, that we will remember that Hebrews is to the Hebrews, not about the Hebrews. It's about the story of Jesus and how he came and the difference he made in the life of so many people here on earth. And that this message was being sent to the people who needed it the most. And that can include us as well. As we study your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us wherever we live, whether it be in a major city or a small town or a village or in a rural area. We pray that your guidance will be with us through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Let's read that again, Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, God promised them a seed, a son who would deliver them from the enemy, recover the inheritance that had been lost, and fulfill the purpose for which they had been created. And that's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The Son would both represent and redeem them by taking their place, and ultimately by destroying the serpent. When Adam and Eve, Ellen White writes in Desire of Ages, page 31, first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfilment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfilment of the promise tarried. End of quote. The promise was later confirmed to Abraham. God swore to him that he would have a seed, a son through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed as we read in Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 to 18, and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And Galatians 3.16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ? And God did the same with David. He promised David that his descendant would be installed by God as his own son, and would be established as a righteous ruler over all the kings of the earth. As we read in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 14. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. And Psalm 89, verses 27 to 29. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, 
and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. What neither Adam and Eve, Abraham nor David probably ever imagined, however, was that their Redeemer's Son would be God himself. Sunday, January 9, In These Last Days The first paragraph of Hebrews reveals that Paul believed he was living in the last days. Scripture employs two expressions about the future that have different meanings. The prophets use the expression last days or latter days to talk about the future in general. For instance, in Deuteronomy 4, 30 and 31, when you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will not forsake you nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. And Jeremiah 23 and verse 20. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you will understand it perfectly. The prophet Daniel used a second expression, the time of the end, to talk more specifically about the last days of earth's history. As you read in Daniel 8, 17, So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. For he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. And Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Read Numbers chapter 24, verses 14 to 19, and Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. What did God promise he would do for his people in the latter days? Firstly, Numbers 24, beginning at verse 14, And now indeed I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So he took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab, and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also, his enemies shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. And Isaiah 2 Beginning at verse 2, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Several Old Testament prophets announced that in the latter days God would raise up a king who would destroy the enemies of his people and who would attract the nations to Israel, as we've just read in Numbers 24 and Isaiah chapter 2. Paul says that these promises were fulfilled in Jesus. He defeated Satan and through the proclamation of the gospel is attracting all the nations to himself. As you read in Colossians 2.15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And in John 12.32, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. 
In this sense, then, the last days have begun because Jesus has fulfilled God's promises. Our spiritual fathers died in faith. They saw and greeted the promises from afar, but did not receive them. We, on the other hand, have seen their fulfilment in Jesus. Let's think for a moment about God's promises and Jesus. The Father promised that he would resurrect his children, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 16. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The wonderful news is that he initiated the resurrection of his children with the resurrection of Jesus, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15.20, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. And Matthew 27, verses 51 to 53, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. The Father also promised a new creation in Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. He has begun to fulfill that promise by creating a new spiritual life in us, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Galatians 6 verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. He promised that he would establish his final kingdom in Daniel 2.44, and in the days of those kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for ever. He inaugurated that kingdom by delivering us from the power of Satan and installing Jesus as our ruler, as we read in Matthew 12, verses 28 to 30. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And Luke 10, verses 18 to 20, And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. This is only the beginning, however. What the Father began to do at Jesus' first coming, he will bring to completion at his second. And so to finish today, look at all the promises God fulfilled in the past. How should this help us to trust him for the promises not yet fulfilled? Monday, January 10. God has spoken to us by his Son. Read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. What is the central idea of these verses? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the Father, by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us 
by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. In the original Greek, Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 4 is only one sentence, and it has been argued that it is the most beautiful in all the New Testament from the point of view of its rhetorical artistry. Its main assertion is that God has spoken to us through his Son, Jesus. For the Jews in the first century AD, the word of God had not been heard for a long time. The last revelation to be expressed in the written word of God had come through the prophet Malachi and the ministries of Ezra and Nehemiah four centuries before. But now, through Jesus, God was speaking to them again. God's revelation through Jesus, however, was superior to the revelation that God had made through the prophets, because Jesus is a greater means of revelation. He is God himself, who created the heaven and the earth and rules the universe. For Paul, the deity of Christ is never in question. It's all but assumed. Also, for Paul, the Old Testament was the Word of God, the same God who spoke in the past continues to speak in the present. The Old Testament communicated a true knowledge of God's will. However, it was possible to understand its fuller meaning only when the Son arrived on earth. In the author's mind, the Father's revelation in the Son provided the key to understanding the true breadth of the Old Testament, just as the picture on the box of a jigsaw puzzle provides the key to finding the correct place for every one of its pieces. Jesus brought so much of the Old Testament to light. Meanwhile, Jesus came to be our representative and our saviour. He would take our place in the fight and defeat the serpent. Similarly, in Hebrews, Jesus is the pioneer or captain and forerunner of believers, as we read in Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And Hebrews 6, verse 20, wherever the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He fights for us and represents us. This also means that what God did for Jesus, our representative, the Father also wants to do for us. He who exalted Jesus at his right hand also wants us to sit with Jesus on his throne, as we read in Revelation 3.21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. God's message to us in Jesus includes not only what Jesus said, but also what the Father did through him and to him, all for our temporal and eternal benefit. So to finish the day, think through what it means that Jesus, God, came to this earth. Why should this truth bring us so much hope? Tuesday, January 11. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. What are some of the things that this passage teaches us about Jesus? Hebrews 1, beginning at verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, 
who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. In this section, we will focus on the portion that says in the English Standard Version translation of verse 3, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Read Exodus 24, 16 and 17, Psalm 4, 6, Psalm 36, 9 and Psalm 89, 15. How do these texts help us understand what the glory of God is? First of all, Exodus chapter 24, Verses 16 and 17, Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Psalm 4, verse 6, There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, Lift up the light of your countenance upon us. And Psalm 36, verse 9, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And Psalm 89, verse 15, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In the Old Testament, the glory of God refers to his visible presence among his people, as we read in the following texts. Exodus 16, verse 7, And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Exodus 24, verses 16 to 17, Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Leviticus 9, and verse 23, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting, and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And Numbers 14, and verse 10, And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. This presence is often associated with light or radiance. Scripture informs us that Jesus is the light who came to this world to reveal the glory of God, as we read in Hebrews 1 verse 3, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. John 1, verses 6 to 9. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And the same chapter, John 1, verses 14 to 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
Think, for instance, of how Jesus appeared in the Transfiguration, as we read in Matthew 17 too. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just as the sun cannot be perceived except by the radiance of its light, God is known through Jesus. From our perspective, the two are one. Because God's glory is light itself, there is no difference in actual being and character between God and Jesus, just as there is no difference between light and its radiance. Hebrews also says that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's substance in Hebrews 1 verse 3. The point of the metaphor is that there is a perfect correspondence in being or essence between the Father and the Son. Note that human beings carry God's image, but not his essence, as we read in Genesis 1.26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The Son, however, shares the same essence with the Father. No wonder that Jesus said in John 14 verse 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And so to finish the day, why is it such great news that Jesus reveals the character and the glory of the Father to us? What does Jesus tell us about what the Father is like? Wednesday, January 12, through whom he made the universe. Hebrews affirms that God created the world through or by Jesus, and that Jesus sustains the world with his powerful word. Read Isaiah 44.28, Isaiah 45.18, and Nehemiah 9.6, because in the Old Testament the Lord affirmed that he created the world alone and that he is the only God, how can we reconcile this affirmation with the affirmations in the New Testament that God created the universe through Jesus, as in Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3? Well, let's start with Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads forth the earth, by himself. And Isaiah 45, verse 18, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord, and there is no other. And Nehemiah 9, verse 6, You alone are the Lord, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. And Hebrews 1 verses 2 and 3 has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Some think that Jesus was merely the instrument through whom God created. This is not possible. First, for Paul, Jesus is the Lord who created the world. He was not a helper. Hebrews 1.10 says that Jesus is the Lord who created the earth and the heavens, and Paul applies to him what Psalm 102.25-27 says about the Lord Yahweh as Creator. Let's look at those verses, beginning in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. 
You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. And Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Second, Hebrews 2.10 says that the universe was created by or through the Father, exactly the same expressions that are applied to Jesus in Hebrews 1 verse 2. Hebrews 2.10 reads, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The Father created, and Jesus created, as we read in Hebrews 1, 2 and 10, and Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. There is a perfect agreement between Father and Son in purpose and activity. This is part of the mystery of the Trinity. Jesus created, and God created, but there is only one Creator, God, which implies that Jesus is God. Meanwhile, Hebrews 4.13 shows that Jesus also is judge. His authority to rule and judge derives from the fact that God created all things and sustains the universe, as we read in Isaiah 44, verses 24 to 28. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, You shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places, who says to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up your rivers, who says to Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Hebrews 1.3 and Colossians 1.17 affirm that Jesus also sustains the universe. We've just read Hebrews 1.3. Let's read Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. This sustaining action probably includes the idea of guidance or governance. The Greek word pheron, P-H-E-R-O-N, meaning sustaining or carrying, is used to describe the wind driving a boat in Acts 27, 15-17, or God leading his prophets in 2 Peter 1, 21. Acts 27, beginning at verse 15, So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive, and running after the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the Sitter Sands, they struck shail, and so were driven. And Second Peter 1, verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Thus, in a real sense, Jesus not only created us, but also sustains us. Every breath, every heartbeat, and every moment of our existence is found in Him, Jesus, the foundation of all created existence. And so, to finish the day, look up Acts 17, verse 28 which says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. What does it say to us about Jesus and his power? Then think about the implications of this same Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. What does this truth teach us about the self-denying character of our Lord?
Thursday, January 13, today I have begotten you. Hebrews 1.5 reports the following words of the Father to Jesus. You are my son, today I have begotten you. What does it mean that Jesus was begotten and when did this happen? Does not this show that Jesus was somehow created by God sometime way in the past as many believe? Well, read Hebrews 1, 5, 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 14, Psalm 2, 7, and Luke 1, 31 and 32. What promise to David did Paul in Hebrews apply to Jesus? Hebrews 1, verse 5, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son? In 2 Samuel 7, 12-14, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. And Psalm 2, verse 7, I will declare a decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And Luke 1, 31 and 32, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Jesus was begotten in the sense that he was installed or adopted by God as the promised ruler, the Son of David. The concept of the divine adoption of the ruler was common in the Greco-Roman world and the East. It gave the ruler legitimacy and power over the land. God promised to David, however, that his son would be the true legitimate ruler of the nations. He would adopt David's son as his own son. Through this process, the Davidic king would become God's protege and his heir. The covenant is fulfilled in Jesus as the son of David. God would defeat his enemies and give him the nations as his inheritance, as we read in Psalm 89, verse 27. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And Psalm 2, verses 7 and 8. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. As we can read in Romans 1, verses 3 and 4, and Acts 13, 32 and 33, Jesus was publicly revealed as God's son. Romans 1, 3 and 4. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And Acts chapter 13 verses 32 and 33. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Jesus' baptism and transfiguration were moments when God identified and announced Jesus as his Son, as we read in Matthew 3.17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and Matthew 17 verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. Yet, according to the New Testament, Jesus became the Son of God with power when he was resurrected and seated at the right hand of God. It was at that moment that God fulfilled his promise to David that his son would be adopted as God's own son and his throne over the nations would be established forever, as we previously read in Second Samuel seven twelve to 14 
Thus, Caesar, a symbol of Rome, was not the legitimate son of God, ruler of the nations. Instead, Jesus Christ was. The begetting of Jesus refers to the beginning of Jesus' rule over the nations and not to the beginning of his existence, because Jesus had always existed. There was never a time when Jesus did not exist, because he is God. In fact, Hebrews 7 verse 3 says that Jesus was neither beginning of days nor end of life. And we'll compare that with Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Because he is eternal. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Thus, the idea of Jesus as God's only begotten Son is not dealing with the nature of Christ as deity, but with his role in the plan of salvation. Through the Incarnation, Christ fulfilled all the covenant promises. Friday, January 14. The coming of Jesus to this earth as the Son of God fulfilled several functions at the same time. In the first place, as the divine Son of God, Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. Through his actions and words, Jesus showed us what the Father really is like and why we can trust and obey him. Jesus also came as the promised son of David, Abraham and Adam, through whom Jesus had promised he would defeat the enemy and rule the world. Thus, Jesus came to take the place of Adam at the head of humanity and fulfil the original purpose God had for them, which we read about in Genesis 1, 26-28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And Psalm 8, verses 3 to 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Jesus came to be the righteous ruler God always wanted this world to have. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 113, The word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless. He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, Ephesians 1.6. The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. The light which fell from the open portals upon the head of the Saviour will fall upon us as we pray for help to resist temptation. The voice which spoke to Jesus says to every believing soul, This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. We have learned that a better understanding of Jesus' words and actions helps us understand God, the Father, better. In what practical ways should a better understanding of Jesus enrich your relationship with God, the Father? 2. 
we learn that the way God spoke to and treated Jesus is the way he wants to speak to and treat us. What should that tell us about how we should treat others? 3. Dwell on the importance of the eternal deity of Christ. What is lost if we believe that Jesus were somehow, in some way, a created being like us, who went to the cross? Contrast that thought with the reality that Christ was the eternal God and he himself went to the cross. What is the big difference between the two ideas? For, in class, talk about giving glory to God. Read Revelation 14.7. How is giving glory to God part of present truth and the three angels' messages? Revelation 14.7 reads, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Drinking with Villagers and it's by Ku Min Ji. The villagers in rural northern Taiwan didn't seem interested in Bible studies. Many worshipped at one of the two Christian churches in the village while others spent their time drinking alcohol. The churchgoers shunned the drinkers. What could I do? I resolved to follow Jesus' example and befriend the drinkers. Christ's method alone, Ellen White wrote in the Ministry of Healing, page 143, will give true success in reaching the people. The Saviour mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. I decided to drink with the villagers. After all, Paul declared, I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some, in his powerful description of how to be an effective missionary in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23. The drinkers didn't have a problem drinking together. They wanted to drink with me, but I gave them tea instead of alcohol. After drinking copious amounts of tea, they didn't have any room left for alcohol. Gradually, they stopped drinking alcohol and began to study the Bible with me. A few months passed and two former drinkers gave their hearts to Jesus and were baptised in August 2019. Tragedy struck six months later. One of the newly baptised Seventh-day Adventists, a young man, fell ill and died. His death hit me hard and I cried out to God, Why? Shortly after the funeral, the mother and brother of the deceased young man unexpectedly came to me and asked for Bible studies. Then other villagers followed their lead. In late 2020, they and other villagers flocked to a one-day health fair organised by the Health Ministries Department of the Adventist Church in Taiwan. The day after the fair, five villagers were baptised. God has infinite mercy and compassion, and he has prepared a way of salvation for every person on earth. The Lord says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, in Isaiah 55, verse 8. All glory belongs to Jehovah God. And there's a lovely photograph of Ku Ming Ji to the left on this page. This mission story illustrates the following components of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. Mission objective number one, to revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving not only pastors, but every church member, young and old, in the joy of witnessing for Christ and making disciples through increased number of church members participating in both personal and public evangelistic outreach initiatives with a goal of total member involvement. And spiritual growth objective number five, to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. Learn more about the strategic plan at IWillGo2020.org.
This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.